Book 3, Chapter 78. Karkati confronts the king and his minister. Vashishta continued. The Rakshasi, who was an offshoot of the great garden of the Rakshatha demon race, made a loud and tremendous yell, like the deep roaring of a cloud. After her deep roar, she muttered in a clattering voice, like the rattling of a thunderclap, following the thundering, rumbling of clouds. She said, ho, ho, what are you who venture abroad in this dread and dreary desert, dark as the great illusion of Maya? which without light of the sun or moon is as gloomy as the gloom of ignorance. Why are you crawling here like insects, bread and stones? What men of great minds are you to have come here like weak minded deviants who have lost their way? You have become an easy prey for me and must meet your fate in my hands in a moment. <clears throat> the king replied, O oh, you demon, what are you and where do you stand? If you are embodied, king, show yourself unto us. Who is terrified by your bodiless form buzzing like a bee? It is the business of the brave to immediately bounce like a lion upon his prey. Therefore, leave off your bragging and show us your prowess at once. Tell me what you want of us and whether you terrify us by your vain boasting or utter these words from your own fear of us. Now measure your body according to your speech and confront us without delay. Show slow gain serves no good. Save the lost time. On hearing the king's speech, she thought it was well said. And immediately showed herself to them, uttering her loud shout with a grinning laughter. The king heard her voice filling the air and resounding in the woods. He saw her huge and hideous person by the light of her open mouth and ivory teeth in the act of her loud laughter. Her eyes were like huge cliffs hurled down by the thunderbolt of the last doomsday. The flashes of her eyeballs blazed in the sky like a pair of bangles or conch shells. The darkness of her appearance would have cast shade on the dark, deep waters at the universal deluge that hid the flame of the undersea fire. Her voice was as coarse as the growling of clouds on the high heads of hills. Her form was like that of a monumental pillar, standing between the heaven and earth. The gnashing of her teeth struck the night rovers with fear at being ground to death under them. Her figure, like those of the nocturnal demons, Yakshas, Rakshasas, and Pishakas, by its erect hairs, muscular limbs, dingy eyes, and coal black color, inspired dread of desire, disaster. The air she breathed in the lungs 
snored like the horrible snoring of horses' nostrils. The tip of her nose was as big as a mallet, and its sides as flat as a pair of billows are winnowing fans. She stood with her jet black body like a rock of dark agate. Her body, joined with her loud laugh, gave her the appearance of the all-subduing night of dissolution. Her bulky body, resembling a thick, cloudy night, approached them like an autumn cloud moving in the forest of the sky. The huge body appeared like a demon rising from underneath the ground and approaching to devour them like an eclipse engulfs the sun and moon. Her ebony breasts were hanging down like two pendant clouds of somber sapphires, or more like two mortal or water pipes with her necklaces hanging on them. Her two arms were suspended from her bulky body like a couple of stout branches from a sturdy oak, or like two logs of burnt wood from her coal-like fire. Seeing her thus, the two valiant men remained as steadfast as those standing on the firm ground of certainty who are never led away by doubt. The minister said, O oh, great friend, what causes this rage and fury in your great soul? It is only the mean and base who are always violent, even in trifling matters. Lay aside this great ado for nothing, which does not become you. The wise pursue their business with coolness to crown it with success. Know the soft and slow breath of our moderation has driven swarms of such flies like yourself. There's like a slight breath of wind scatters dry leaves and straws. Setting aside all haughtiness and passion of spirit, the wise man conducts his business with a calm, coolness of the mind, assisted by reason and practical wisdom. One must manage his affairs with slowness, whether it prove effectual or not, because overruling destiny disposes of everything which human effort has no power to prevent. Now let us know your desire and what your object with us. Because no suitor who has come to us has been refused of his prayer or allowed to return in disappointment. Hearing these words, the Rakshasi pondered in her mind. Oh, the serene composure of these two lion-like men and the affability of their conduct with others. I do not think them to be men of the ordinary kind. And even more wonderful, their inner soul is expressed in the outward gestures of their faces and eyes, and in the tone and tenor of their speech, the words, face and eyes express the inner thoughts of the wise 
and these go together like salt and water of the sea. My intention is already known to them, as theirs also to me. I cannot destroy them when they are indestructible because of their moral excellence. So here we see the Rakshasi Karkati is an agent of karma. And this story is giving us this kind of simile about how karma comes to individuals to manifest. But some karma always comes in the form of an agent of karma, some other being, a human being or an animal or some being of sort. will be there in our environment, ready to become an agent of our karma if it finds that we have the karma that needs to be balanced. So in this case, this agent of karma is not finding anything in need of balance and we'll probably leave them alone. Verse 32, I understand them to be acquainted with spiritual knowledge, without which there cannot be a good understanding. Now this spiritual knowledge spontaneously manifests when karmic traces are balanced. Because what is the spiritual knowledge? Well, the spiritual knowledge comes in two forms. One form is the divine karmic traces. As one balances enough individual karmic traces, one begins to flow in synchronicity with divine karmic traces. And then just like a river flowing down the side of a mountain, life just flows effortlessly in complete harmony with the universe. But beyond this spiritual knowledge of divine karmic traces, there is the silent witness, which also emerges spontaneously when enough karmic traces have been balanced. And when we begin our meditation, we always look for the evidence of the silent witness as it is there between the individual karmic traces that form a web in consciousness. And then once we find that silence shining through all the incessant thoughts and activity of the mind caused by the karmic traces, we endeavor to identify with it, become the silent witness, sometimes more successful than others. But when we are, it's always the same beautiful experience. At that point, 
the body takes on an effortlessness of its activity. If we're sitting in meditation, the body sits up straight and erect, effortlessly, as if being pulled up by a string attached to the top of the head. And then we find ourselves as if we're moving beyond time. And all the activities going on in the universe around us are moving in time and we are eternal. beyond time. And in that comes delightful bliss, peace, and tranquility. So we identify with the silent witness that is beyond the divine karmic traces that originates in the absolute realm in the form of Parma Jyoti, the effulgence of Krishna. And when we're identified with that silent witness, it changes our composure, changes our expressions on our face, changes the way the body conducts itself, changes the speech that comes from the body. Everything aligns perfectly with the divine karmic traces. Because knowledge of the indestructibility of the spirit takes away the fear of death and these men lack fear. Therefore, I shall ask them something about which I have doubts. They who fail to ask the wise what they know not must remain dunces throughout their lives. Having thought so, she opened her mouth, expressing her roaring voice and loud laughter for a while, and asked her question. Tell me, O oh, you sinless men who are so brave and valiant, who are you and from where have you come? The very sight of you has raised my regard for you. Like the good hearted become friends with one another even at their first sight. The minister said, this is the king of the Kiratas, and I am his counselor. We have come out tonight in our nightly round to apprehend malicious beings like you. It is the duty of princes to punish the wicked. Both by day and night, those who trespass the bounds of their duty must be made like fuel to the fires of destruction. The Rakshasi said, King, you have a good minister. A bad one is unbecoming of a king. All good kings have wise counselors and they make a good king. The wise minister is the king's guide to justice. And it is he 
who elevates both king and his people. Justice is the first of the four cardinal virtues. Justice, temperance, prudence, and frugality. And it is only the virtue of a ruler who is called the incarnation of justice. Dharma, avatar. Well, the minister has revealed his true nature. If we look at the king and the minister in a different light, we see the king is the ego and the minister is the silent witness. And when the ego is dominated by or accompanied with the silent witness, then the individual physiology conducts its business in accord with the divine karmic traces. Verse 40, but kings also must have spiritual knowledge because it is the great, greatest human knowledge. The king who has this knowledge becomes the best of kings. The minister who knows the soul can give the best counsel to guide other souls. As we progress on the path to achieving moksha, our ego acquires spiritual knowledge. The ego begins to understand that it exists only as a collection of individual karmic traces and it has been busy allowing the balancing of the negative karmic traces so that it can optimize its existence as the reflection of all the positive qualities. A man who feels for others what makes a good ruler. Whoever is unacquainted with this rule is not fit to be either a ruler or its minister. If you know this fundamental principle, it is good and you shall prosper. Otherwise, you wrong yourself and your subjects in which case you shall be my prey. There is only one way for you two young men to escape from my clutches. You must answer my intricate questions according to your best wits and judgment. Now you king and you counselor, give me the solution, the answer to the questions that I ask of you. If you fail to give the proper answers, as you have agreed to, then you must fall under my hands like anyone who fails to keep his words. Chapter 79. The Rakshasi Arkati's question. Vasishta continued. After saying so, the fiend began to ask her question. You should be attentive to them, Ra, like the king who told her to go on. The Rakshasi resumed. 
what is that a minuscule atomic particle that is one yet many and as vast as the ocean and which contains innumerable worlds like the bubbles of the sea? What is a void yet no void? which is something yet nothing. What makes me and you, and where do I or you abide or subside? What moves unmoved and unmoving and stands without stopping? What is intelligent? yet is as dull as a stone. What presents its variety in the emptiness of understanding? Now notice about these questions. These are questions for contemplation. There are a couple of forms of meditation. One form of meditation is dharana, thinking a mantra, a meaningless sound which carries the attention of consciousness into deeper and deeper levels of transcendence, transcending physical, transcending pranamaya kosha, transcending monomaya kosha, always transcending, going beyond until it stands in the face of Paramajoti, Krishna's effulgence. beyond even the divine karmic trace. And then there's the other form of meditation, which some call contemplation, and which we call sanyama. The reason we call it sanyama is because sanyama is a very precise practice of thinking a sutra that has meaning. Then, or while thinking that sutra that has meaning, we engage the imagination. We think about the sutra. This is the contemplation part of Sanyama. And then we understand that it is impossible for the mind to manifest anything. And this is a very important and key element to the process of sanyama and all forms of contemplative meditation. We must let go and allow Paramajoti to manifest the answer. Using logic and reason and the intellect is not part of contemplation. That is part of wallowing in ignorance. And so what Vashista has instructed Ram is, you should be attentive 
to these questions. And what that means is put your attention on them. Then it is unstated. But then let them go and allow them to manifest, allow the answers to manifest in your pure consciousness. Now what the Rakshasi is trying to do here is evoke that level of intelligence by asking these questions. And asking the questions over many, many instances. Not just one question and then waiting for the answer, but asking many, many questions, which also reinforces the concept that one does not use the intellect and reasoning to come up with these answers. There's no time for that. No time is given for all this endless reasoning and intellectual discussion. The answers to these questions will come forth spontaneously if one is giving the correct answers. So there's no detriment in having 25 questions being asked one after the other because the answer is going to come from a place of timelessness, eternal. On the level of the ego and the intellect, the intellect that got us into this problem in the first place, the intellect that made the mistake of thinking I exist the answers will come spontaneously and effortlessly and will be exactly right because they're coming from the source of all. Continuing verse five, what is the nature of fire without its burning quality? So we, like Ram, should be listening to these questions attentively. The Yoga Vashishta is giving us a very beautiful instruction in Sanyama. What is that non-flammable substance? that produces fire and its flame. Who is not of the nature of the ever-changing solar, lunar, and stellar lives, but is the never-changing enlightener of the sun, moon, and stars? Now, if your ego is engaged at this point, you're beginning to feel a little frustrated and maybe even panicky because there's so many questions. Please stop asking and I will try to answer. If you're a silent witness, if you are the silent witness and observing, you are simply bringing these beautiful statements into awareness and letting go. Who 
who having no eyes gives the eye its sight. Who gives eyesight to the eye, eyeless vegetables and the blind mineral creation? Who is the maker of heavens? And who is the author of the nature of things? Who is the source of this world of jewels? And whose treasure? are all the gems contained in it? So each one of these questions is pointing to pure consciousness. What is that monad which shines in darkness? And is the point that is and is not? What is that iota which is imperceptible to all? And what is that jot that becomes an enormous mountain? To whom is the twinkling of the eye as long as a kalpa? millennium and a whole age only a moment whose omnipresence is equal to its absence and whose omniscience is the same as his total ignorance. Who is called spirit, but is no heir in itself? Who is said to be sound or word, but is none of them himself? He is called the all, but is nothing at all of all that exists. He is known as ego, but no ego is he himself. What is gained by the greatest effort over a great many births? Which when gained at last is hard to retain owing to the spiritual carelessness of mankind. Who is, who being in easy circumstances in life has not lost his soul in it? Who being only an atom in creation does not reckon the great Mount Meru as a particle. What is no more than an atom and fills a space of many leagues? What atomic particle is measured in many miles? Whose glance and nod makes all beings act their parts as players. What minute particle contains many mountain chains in its bosom? Who is bigger than Mount Meru in its minuteness? And who being smaller than the point of a hair is higher than the highest rock. Whose light brought out the lamp of lights from the bosom of darkness? And what a minute particle contains the minute of ideas without end? What has no flavor and gives savor to all things? 
whose presence, when withdrawn from all substances, reduces them to infinitesimal atoms. Who is that, by his self permeation, connects the particles composing the world and after their separation and dissolution? What imperceptible power rejoins the detached particles to recreate the new world? Who, being formless, has a thousand hands and eyes, and in whose twinkling of an eye comprehends the periods of many cycles together. In what microscopic particle does the world exist as a tree in its seed? And by what power do the unproductive seeds of atoms become productive of worlds? Whose glance causes the production of the world, like from its seed? Who creates the world without any motive or material? Who has no visual organs and enjoys the pleasure of seeing drishti and is the viewer drashta of himself? which he makes the object of his view. Who has no object of vision before him, sees nothing without him, but looks upon himself as an infinity void of everything visible within it. Who shows the subjective side of the soul by itself as an objective view and represents the world like the shape of a bracelet in its own metal. Who has nothing existent beside himself and in whom all things exist? like the waves existing in the waters and whose will make them appear as different things. Both time and space are equally infinite and indivisible, like the essence of God in which they exist. Then, why do we try to differentiate and separate them, like water from its fluidity? What inner cause in us makes the soul believe the unreal world to be real? And why does this fallacy continue at all times? The knowledge of the worlds, whether present, past, or future, is all a great error. Yet, what is that immutable being that contains the seed of this phenomenal wilderness? What being, without changing itself, and before it develops into creation, shows these phenomena, such as the shape of the seed of the world, that becomes the form of a developed forest of created beings.